the KRGS Doors Show, proudly brought to you by KRGS Doors. For all your shopfront roller shutters, roller grills, fold enclosures and bifold doors, visit www.krgsdoors.com.au. Welcome to the KRGS Doors podcast. I'm your host, Drew Blackman. The aim of our podcast is to talk to cool people with cool stories, whether it be our suppliers, customers, staff, other business owners or people from different walks of life and get to know them a bit better. If you're interested in coming on, drop us a line or email or connect with us via Facebook and we can have a chat to see what we can do. Today on episode 49 of the two-year-old KRGS Doors podcast, I'm joined by KRGS Doors Managing Director Clayton Blackman and we talk to Darcy McDonald, a mad rugby league fan and she always knew that she wanted to work in rugby league. Current journalist and reporter for Fox Sports and former Canterbury Bankstown Bulldogs cheerleader. Darcy tells us what it's like to work in rugby league and the reason why she got asked to leave the dog's cheerleading ranks. I'll also let you in on our next episode's guest, but for now, please welcome to the podcast, Miss Darcy McDonald. If this doesn't turn you on, folks, you haven't got a switch! Darcy, thank you very much for joining us on the KRGS Doors podcast. What is the Darcy McDonald story? Gosh, where do I begin? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, first and foremost, I'm a diehard rugby league fan, um, full transparency, a Bulldogs fan. Um, I need to say that because it's part of my story. Hectic. Um, we might wrap yeah. up the podcast then That'll now if that's the case. That's, yeah, yeah, that's enough time. <laughs> <laughs> we're, dra- we're diehard Dragon supporters. So I thought I could see a jersey in the back. Oh, commiserations. <laughs> oh, mate. It's, Darcy, it's only up from here, mate. <laughs> Uh, I'll tell you what, it's been tough going for Bulldogs fans lately too, so I feel your pain. <laughs> <laughs> We're not used to um, it. We're not used to it. Yeah. Well, welcome on board. <laughs> <laughs> um, but basically, yeah, I was born into a Bull- Bulldogs mad family, so I had no choice but to support them. My my grandfather was one of the original members, um, I think like a ticket holder or whatever, a member at Belmore um, way back in the day. And then um, he took my mum to games. She was an only child. And then... Uh, she became a diehard um, Bulldogs fan and, you know, she grew up, she met my dad who was actually in a Tigers family, um, but I like to say happy wife, happy life. Um, and so he converted to the Bulldogs and then pretty much like my my brother likes to claim that he's a grand final celebration baby. Um, <laughs> he was born. <laughs> what year was that, 84? What? He was born nine months after the 88 grand final. Oh, okay. That was against the Tigers. Oh, was it? Yeah. Oh, why is he saying that then? Oh, 80, no. 88, no, 88 was vers- Bulldogs won, but V the Tigers. Yes. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, he reckons, yeah, he was born in, um, nine months after. There you go. Yeah, in July. Um, I think that works out nine months. I haven't done my yeah. math. It, it, it does work out nine months because I'm, uh, as we mentioned, we're Dragons fans and I'm born in 1980. And St. George won the comp in 79. So I'm claiming the same. I reckon I'm a grand final victory baby as well. <laughs> it makes sense, doesn't it? My parents um, deny it, but I mean, <laughs> it works out. It checks out. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, basically, like from the moment I was born, I was taken to games. Um, I went to, I think I was the, at the 95 grand final. I was only three years old. So obviously don't remember anything. And then, yeah, I, I went to every single game. I grew up before I, before I, um, understood footy, I absolutely <laughs> adored and idolized the cheerleaders because I grew up as a dancer and I yeah. loved all the sparkly things. So absolutely like thought they were the coolest things ever. Um, and you know, my weekends consisted of like, I'd finish school, we'd go to Friday night games or I'd, you know, get taken out of, um, pulled out of ballet early on a Saturday to make sure we could get to the Bulldogs games. You know, we traveled to Melbourne. That's a diehard, isn't it? Diehard. My mom has the same, she still does it. She still gets the same tickets in the exact same row. Um, ever since the dog started playing at Olympic Park, she's like superstitious. Yeah, so she always sits in row 13 because that's her lucky number. Uh, um, but, yeah, that's pretty much my whole life. And then I, um, I yeah, went to the 2004 grand final. That was some of the best memories ever. Um, and a funny story about that is we hopped on a supporter bus and uh, when we were leaving, I don't know if my dad did this accidentally or it was on purpose, um, he got us on the bus that was actually carrying all the family and friends of the players. Yeah. And um, it took us 
straight into Canterbury Leagues Club, the gate was all shut off, all the yeah. gates and all the fans had to like stand outside. But this bus took us inside, like VIP entry. Straight into and the I car remember, park. Straight in. And I remember my dad sitting there just like, ack natural, ack natural. And, like <laughs> other parents and that is asking him, well, do you know what time the function starts? He's like, oh, yeah, I think it's, you know, just like going <laughs> along with it. <laughs> but, <laughs> and, but I was only young. I think I was 11 years old. Um, and so my parents obviously wanted to stay and party the whole night. So they rang my grandfather um and the tigers fan uh and he met us at the um he met us at a gate and i got chucked over the fence and i didn't get to i didn't get to stay but they stayed um but yeah that's a funny story from the 2004 grand final um fast forward to 2000 and 2010 i auditioned for the bulldogs cheerleaders because you know that was my childhood dream um and did that for five years and then while I was cheerleading, that's when I started to realise I wanted to be a reporter or a journalist. Um, and then when I finished, uh, I was doing a full-time ballet course at the same time. When I finished that, I enrolled in uni, did uni, um, couldn't get a job anywhere. <laughs> it's so a really hard industry to crack. Was so it, did, did journalism, did Dust? You did journalism at, uh, yeah. Yeah, I did media and comms and majored in journalism and then, um, and then, yeah, couldn't couldn't get a job anywhere. I honestly applied for every single job that was out there. Um, and then I decided I'll just pick the company I want to work for. Um, <laughs> and I, yeah, and then I'll start anywhere. And I picked Fox Sports. I started as a receptionist. Oh, wow. And then I've had to grind my way for like six years <laughs> to get to where I am now. So it's, yeah, it's been a journey. <laughs> so how old were you when you started the cheerleading side of things? So I was 18, so you have to be 18 to audition. And I remember um, when, so the clubs would put out like a little notice on um, their website saying, you know, we're holding auditions on X, Y, Z day. And I remember the audition day fell smack bang in the middle of when I was going to be on schoolies. Um, and my schoolies trip was booked through like this company where basically your entire grade goes over to Fiji. It was almost yeah. like a giant excursion with alcohol. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I was so like hell bent on auditioning that I told my mom, I was like, I'll go to school is late. I don't care if I miss it. Like I want to be a cheerleader. <clears throat> and we ended up just, um, we, mom was like, no, you shouldn't have to do that. So we emailed the dogs and was like, hey, you know, this is a situation. And then they said to me, you know what, like, don't worry about that audition. You can come when you come home from school is come to like a um, one of the rehearsals and we'll treat that as like a private audition. Um, did that, passed that, and then I had to do um, like a quiz. And I remember I went into the head offices. They were at Olympic Park, Olympic Park at the time. And I remember doing the quiz and I took it in. And the guy, he was like, this is remarkable. He's like, this is the first time we've ever had a cheerleader get 100% on the wow. quiz. Oh, yeah. And I was like, um, <laughs> wait until you get to know me <laughs> because I was born for this. <laughs> <laughs> this is me. This sums me up. This is my yeah, goal. So so were you You were doing ballet while you were cheerleading? Yeah. And then I, we, you were doing uni as well? Yeah, so I when I finished school, um, I had applied for uni uh, but deferred it for a couple of years and I did a full-time ballet and contemporary course for two years, which was pretty intense. It was like six or seven hours a day, five days a week, and you're training mm. nonstop. Um, so I did that for two years and I, yeah, did that full-time and then my cheerleading was on top of that. Um, and then I didn't – I when I finished that dance course – that's when I picked up uni. But, yes, I was juggling uni with cheerleading and um, I was dance teaching, lots of casual little jobs to kind of keep keep my head above water. It was a busy time but a fun time. Your feet would have been covered in blisters, I reckon, during yeah. that time. Absolutely. Yeah. A few calluses there on oh, the toes. Yes. <laughs> yep, between the ballet shoes and the cheerleading boots. <laughs> They've been through hell. Do you, do you critique the cheerleaders now? Do you, who's, got, who's got the best current cheerleaders in the NRL? I'd say probably the Sharks. Um, they've always been really, really strong. Um, I'm originally from the Sutherland Shire and I know that the dance schools in the Sutherland Shire produce some brilliant dancers. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, and the lady that runs it, Jack, is a good friend of mine and she's absolutely fantastic and um, a total pro. 
Um, sharks have always been fantastic. And if I wasn't a diehard dogs fan, I would have cheerleaded for the sharks. Um, but there, I would have been kicked out of home and living on the street if I did that. <laughs> both of our, um, <laughs> actually, both of our daughters. I had a daughter and Drew had a daughter. Were they both danced in the Shire? Yeah, Planet Dance. Planet Dance. Yeah, Planet Dance. Yeah, yes. I know Planet Dance. Yeah, yes, they were both dancers with uh, with Planet Dance at one stage. Yes. In their gro- as they were growing up. I'm sure you've probably heard of the Dance Store <clears throat> Block. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I yeah, I used to work there. I've, which one? One at Miranda. Uh, Miranda. Yeah. There you go. You probably sold us. Uh, I think, sold us tap shoes and I think uh, you'll find our doors were on the entrance of block at Westfield Miranda. Our KRGS doors, they yes. They were certainly were. There you go. No way. Hundred percent. Yeah. So that was again like I was doing while I was cheerleading and it was so much fun because I was, you know, my job was to sell dancewear and ballet shoes. It was it was awesome. Perfect. <laughs> now, as you said, you started out as a receptionist at Fox. How long did you do that? And then what were the jobs along the way for that type of thing? So I was uh, on reception for Fox for about 18 months. And during that time, um, it was actually a really awesome job because I got to build connections within the company um, without the pressure. Sometimes I feel like when you're trying to trying to get a job or whatever and, and and you're trying to build connections and the person knows that you're trying to get a job it feels a little disingenuous um but when I was on reception I was able to build those connections and they were genuine connections with people in the company and um you know they all knew my background they knew where I wanted to go but I was you know to them I was just the girl working on reception but I used to do extra things so I used to um I would just would basically put my hand up for a million and one things, every opportunity I could get. And I used to come in earlier um, to run the auto queue for Fox Sports News. So I'd do that from like 5 a.m. to 8 a.m. And then I would go and do my reception shift from 8 to 4. Um, And then I sometimes on the weekends came in and got trained on the digital video unit. And then, but my probably like my little break was – I went to the digital editor, the digital NRL editor who runs would run the website, and I asked if I could just write an opinion piece, um, a weekly opinion piece, uh, just to kind of, you know, get my name out there and, and practice writing, and he'd give me feedback. And thank goodness he said yes. Um, and it was really cool. My first story was actually in Women in League Ground. So I got oh, to yeah. write about... Yeah, so I got to write about my journey as a cheerleader and everything like that. So it was really cool that my first published article, I got to actually write about my life and my journey like no one gets to do that um so I was doing that for a while and then I ended up getting um getting an email from the editor of the big league magazine um so I think when I was at uni I must have I I remember doing like a little assignment and my uni tutor I said why don't you just send it into the big league because I, I was part of my this assignment that I'd done that I was pitching like a little blipped out magazine for the big league and they're like just send it in you know you know you don't never know and I remember they got back to me at the time we're like oh you know we 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 can't we haven't got the budget for it blah 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 but you know thanks so much we'll keep your details on file and so they ended up getting in touch with me while I was working on reception at Fox and offered me a six-month contract and that was my first full-time journalism um job yeah, as a journalist at the Big League magazine. And it was awesome because I actually, way back in 2013, um, was a finalist in the Big League Cheerleader Cheerleading of the competition. competition. Yeah. I would have a copy. Oh, Darcy, I know you'll find this hard to believe, but I would have a copy of that Big League magazine. Probably. I Honestly, there are a lot of people that collected every single magazine. I've got every, I've got every issue. I've got every issue over here yeah. on the shelves. From nineteen seventy, from nineteen seventy five. I love that. And I, Never miss. As a diehard footy fan, it, I would used to go down to the cage, and I had yeah every single issue that was ever created, and I just used to sit there and be like, "This is so cool." Um, it was the type of job that was just it was a perfect job for a genuine footy fan. We've got to get Darcy. What have we got to do to get the big league back? I don't know. It's, I miss I, it's it. got to be a budget thing. I know. I miss it too. It was, you know what? It was such a good starting spot for journalists. There's there are so many reporters and journalists in this industry that started at Big League, um, and and you learn the basics. And I learned so much in that job that has helped me um, in my career now that I wouldn't have learned had I not 
had the time in in big league it was a really um nice environment with with genuine people and people who just love footy the thing i liked about the big league das was when you yeah. open it up i like you'd have all three grades so you knew the reserve grade players you knew the yeah. the under 21s or the under 23s players you know you knew every play yeah. every player in the club exactly and we yeah. go we go to the games yeah, we go to games. Well, we were, that's right. We were involved with Ron Massey through Cabramatta Rugby League yeah. Club, and um, we used to go to games. And you'd, you'd obviously we're like you with the Bulldogs family. We, we've got tickets to Jubilee. We've had the same seats yeah. for the last sixteen years. Um, yeah. But you don't. I have no idea who's in the lower grades for Saints now. I couldn't. I couldn't tell you. Yeah. I wouldn't have a clue yeah. because I haven't had the big league magazine. What was the last year? Two thousand and twenty. What? 2019? Yeah, it would have been 2020 before COVID. 2020 before COVID, yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah. I've spoken to people at the NRL and said, hey, we've got to get this back because we need a, mm-hmm. we need a magazine, rugby league magazine. Yeah, I agree. And it was cool because I had like the little, little league pull out yep. section for the kids. kids and everything like that. And, um, yeah, it was, it was so awesome. It was such a, such a fun job. But I was there for, Six months, six months turned into a year. Actually, my contract got extended, and then I don't know if I had a bit of like a quarter life crisis. Um, but I thought, oh my goodness, like I'm not going to crack this industry. Like I'm just, I, I, I'm not going to be able to do it. And so I ended up quitting, and I left, and I went and um, got a job at Foxtel, um, different to Fox Sports. It was before they had merged. It was Foxtel, and it was nothing to do with sport. I was just in internal comms. Um, yeah, like worked in HR basically. Um, that lasted six months and I was bored out of my brains. Um, <laughs> I've got to get back into great, sport. Literally, I had a great, like awesome boss, awesome colleagues, cruisy job. Hey, wasn't bad, but I was just like bored. There's got to be more to life than this. <laughs> yeah. And I remember the funny thing is, is how I ended up at Fox Sports again is um, this lady who runs wardrobe at Fox Sports got in touch with me um, and she was like, Das, I need someone to hand out the trophies on stage at the Dally M's and I know your background and I know what your dreams are and I know that you would really appreciate a gig like this. Would you want to do it? And I remember I was driving when I saw it pop up on my phone and I pulled over, I squealed. I think I replied to her, <laughs> like e- emailed her twice just to make sure she, in case she didn't get the first one. <laughs> and I was so excited. And so it was such a cool gig. Like I was standing on stage. So all of a sudden you're in front of the camera. Hands. Yeah, and I'm handing out trophies to, you know, Craig <clears> Bellamy. Um, you know, I think James Tedesco won the Daly M that year. I was standing backstage with Scott Morrison, the Prime Minister at the time. Um, it was crazy. And then I remember afterwards I was thinking opportunities don't like like this don't, come. don't land in your lap. Mm. For yeah, you know, they land in your lap for a reason. Yeah. Like I would be stupid not to explore what the universe is trying to tell me right now. Um, so I introduced myself to Steve Crawley, who's yeah. you know the big boss at Fox Sports, and um, and I had actually met him when I was on reception, but I was like, he probably doesn't remember me. Um, so I reintroduced myself at the Dally M's, and then um, you know, a couple of weeks have passed by, and I sent him an email, and I was like, look, I exited this industry way too early i want back in and i will start anywhere and just by chance he rang me and he was like we've actually got a job going in our website so this is the team that you know i used to pitch these opinion pieces yeah. while i was on reception there was a job going in that team and i was like great so i went in had an interview um and then yeah they offered me a job and that was january 2020 and i've and i've been there ever since so i still work on the website i do my sideline stuff as well but i'm still working you know, predominantly in the website team. And that all came about because I handed out the trophies, trophies at the Dally the M's. <laughs> How good is yeah. that? That's actually a tip, a tip for young players that's listening. And, and <clears throat> Clayton mentioned earlier, we had Ben Fordham on as well. And, yeah. and his story is very similar to yours that he'd go in of a weekend and be a bit of a, a rouse about and, and get the coffees and yeah. do a bit of everything. And this then all of a radio, sudden, radio at 2GB. all of a sudden he, he got a little piece here and a, a little piece there. And then it, it comes to it. And now he's got his own radio show and he was on channel nine and things like that. So that's a, a really good tip for young players to, to really go, okay, well, what do I want to do? How do I get my foot in the door and yeah. then expand from there? 
Yeah, absolutely. Like, like I said earlier, like I applied when I finished uni, I had I did an internship at the Bulldogs in the media team, and I did a bit of work experience with Channel Seven. Um, and I applied. I kid you not, not even sport. Like I was applying for lifestyle politics. I could t- couldn't tell you the first thing about politics, <laughs> but Probably I was a good applying thing. for. Yeah, every single possible job in journalism. I don't care what it was, local journalism, like everything. I was applying for everything and I got knocked back from everything. I just could not crack it and I don't know why. It was such a hard industry. They say it's an entry-level job, but you've got to have like five years experience. (laughs) But anyways, um, and so that's why I was like, I'm going to pick the company that I want to work for, take any job, that's your foot in the door. It's Yeah, you've got to kind of think outside the box. Otherwise, if you're just applying for journalism jobs, you're going to get forever knocked back because there's few and far, like there's not many out there and even if it's an entry-level job, (laughs) You're still not going to get it without experience. I don't know why. And even so, and, and probably the receptionist one is a good place to start too because everyone's got to come through the front door and, good morning, Darcy, how are you? And you, they, well, so they need they need me to sign off on their packages. I need to order their stationery. Everyone's got to be nice to the girl on reception. A hundred percent that uh, you uh, you could make or break some of them people as well in yeah, a, in a you're sense. Not, you're not coming in. Absolutely. I 100% had favourites and I would let them know earlier if their packages had arrived and the people that weren't nice to me, oh, I don't know. Uh, I haven't seen it yet. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) But it fits me well. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) Now, with your love for rugby league, and was there ever a consideration of playing? No. So, you know what? I think when I was younger, if I had seen the NRLW players, I probably would have played, but you know that saying you can't be what you can't see? Yeah. And I think I and I know there were girls playing rugby league because I remember going to my brother's games when I was really little and there and there was always a couple of girls that played in his teams. But like I yeah, I think if I saw it more, I probably would have because I would rough around with my brother, we'd tackle and everything at home. So like I, I probably would have loved it, but I never played it. And I, and looking back, yeah, if I reckon if the NRLW was around and I could see these girls on the big stage doing it, I would have probably idolised them. But for me, I went to dancing and dancing was my life and, and that's probably why I idolised the cheerleaders because back then um, there wasn't that many girl like women on TV Um and yeah, the the female presence that I saw at football games when I was young were the cheerleaders. So for yeah. me, they were like, "That's what I want to be. I want to be sitting on the other side of the fence." How cool is that? So yeah, I never played it, and I I, I remember I did I did though I played Oztag, and I remember um, trying out for the school rugby league team. I think I would have been, gosh, year four ish, year three, year four, and I remember vividly remember getting tackled by the biggest guy on the field <laughs> and he landed on me and I was like, I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> it's enough for me. For me. <laughs> yeah. Growing up in the Shire, what what school did you attend? So I went to Our Lady of Fatima Primary School um, and then St. Pat's High School. Okay, right in the heart of the uh, Cronulla Sharks there. And yeah. just on a side note, what team did your brother play for? So he played for Aquinas Colts. Okay, um, men only. Where, yeah, yeah, where the Braley brothers, um, I think Kyle Flanagan. Flanner, yes. Yeah, played Bronson for. Cherry. And then he ended up, yeah, Bronson Sherry. It's a very good club. And then um, he ended up leaving at some point. I think he would have been a bit older, maybe around 16, 15, 16. He ended up leaving and went to the Kingsgrove Colts because then he, I remember he played Harold Matz for the Dragons. So he ended up being in the Dragon system. Um but yeah, I'm. Oh, I have like a lot of memories going to. I think it was called Blacksland Oval. Blacksland Oval. Blacksland they still play Oval. out of there. So, yeah. Yeah, I've got a lot of memories Drew, Drew referees in the Shire, Darcy, and his and his son. Fun? Yes, yes. So I was actually at Blacksland on Sunday, refereeing up there. So, on that, what is the biggest challenges you face in your role? Um, I think it's definitely kind of building a profile. Um, I think when in in journalism, um, it's such a competitive industry and there's not that many roles to go around. So sometimes I feel like you, you do you have to do a lot of work for free. Um, and sometimes you can get a little taken advantage of in that sense. So you have to kind of um 
yeah, it's it's very it's a fine line of of remembering your worth as a, as an employee and whatnot, but also um, you got to earn your stripes as well. If if that kind of makes sense, um, you know, my partner he played a lot of football. Um, he doesn't he doesn't he plays Ron Massey now just for the cash basically. Um, but he used to he played a lot of New South Wales Cup and and he was trying to crack the NRL for quite some time. And, and he always says to me that my job, like my industry, is very similar to rugby, like playing football, playing NRL, because you're trying to crack something that's it's really competitive and it's really difficult and you've got to do a lot of stuff for free and you've got to work really hard and it's like you don't even know if you're going to make it um and you've got to make a lot of sacrifices so i think it's 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 definitely building a profile is the hardest thing in this industry um and yeah and, and you've got to have a lot of resilience because like i said like i started on reception it was it would be almost seven years now and i've only just started to consistently do sideline for nrl games this year um that's how long it's taken me to get opportunities um to yeah to live live my dream and do the things that I want to do. You really have to hang around like a bad smell pretty much. <laughs> just just on that, Dash, you better tell us, um, let the people know who your partner is and, and involvement in rugby league. Yeah, so my partner's name is Brad Kieran. Um, he, it's a, we got, it's a funny story. Um, we actually met at the Bulldogs. So I when I was cheerleading and he was playing under 20s at the time, um, we actually met uh, at, they used to do this thing called the etiquette dinner. Um, with the under-20s players and they would bring them in and they would teach them about, I guess, etiquette and, you know, how to hold conversations with people and yada, yada, yada. And then they would bring in um, the cheerleaders and then, you know, we'd be dressed up really lovely, professional, and they'd plonk us on the tables with the players. And it, a lot of players at that age, um, they they could be quite shy because yeah. all they've known is rugby league and, and, and it was basically to take them out of their comfort zone. Anyways, my partner's not shy. Um, and I remember going over to his table um, and he was such a smart ass that he was trying to get brownie <laughs> points with the lady that was like marking them. And he got up and he pulled my chair out for me and everything. <laughs> like, it was just him trying to get brownie points. Anyways, um, you know, we had a great night, blah, blah, blah. Like, he was only a baby at the time. I think he was only 18. Um, and I, I'm three years older than him. Um, and... I think six or so months passed and he was just relentlessly sending me messages on Instagram. I used to ignore him. <laughs> and then I finally gave in. <laughs> I bet you he would tell a different version of this story, <laughs> but I'm telling the truce. <laughs> <laughs> he told us that you were inst- uh, sending him messages on Instagram. He, Is that right? He tells everyone that. <laughs> <laughs> but he was relentlessly, relentlessly messaging me. Um, I ended up giving in to him. And um, yeah, the rest is history. We've been together for over eight years now. But um, we, he, uh, you're not meant to actually date players. You're not allowed to date players um, as a cheerleader. And it was never ever in writing. And I remember it was the start of the 2015 season, and he was in his last year of under twenties. And I, we were just talking. You know, we weren't in a relationship or anything like that. And I remember it was the first. It was my final. Ended up being my final year, which I'll get to in a second. Why? Um, but I was the captain and choreographer and I remember meeting with someone from the dogs and they were like, look, we're going to get all the girls to sign contracts this year. And I was like, yeah, cool, no worries. And they hand over the contract and there was a line saying, I will not fraternise with players. And I was like, oh, boy, <laughs> <laughs> this is <laughs> this could be bad. But at the time I was like, oh, I'm not really dating this guy. I'm just chatting. We're just mates. So signed it, whatever. We ended up dating, um, and it was very much in secret for the entire, pretty season. much the entire season. Yeah, and, well, mind you, mind you, all the players knew um, <laughs> because I remember he used to tell me down in the in down the bottom in Belmore where they all train. Um, they had they had a wall or something in there where they used to just basically take the piss out of each other. And I think maybe like I might have tagged him in something on Facebook in like a comment. Or, my, or vice versa, and one of the players had seen it. They printed it out and stuck it up on the wall. Um, another player went over to one of the physio's computers and there was like a photo of me on file from like our headshot day or whatever, and then they found like an old photo of Brad from like Harold Matz or something or said um, <laughs> SG Bory had like a mullet and braces and everything, <laughs> and they like edited them together with a big love heart around them and put it as the background of oh. the physio. <laughs> All the football staff knew. Um 
but the head office staff, um, they didn't know. Well, that, I didn't think they knew. Um, that rule was brought in. That rule was brought in by Gus. Gus yeah. was one of Gus's rules. <laughs> it was. Yeah, it was bad. And, and anyway, so it was. It, we kept it very quiet. Um, and then anyway, someone, <laughs> one of the uh, other cheerleaders, found out, and um, she she dogged me in. <laughs> Wow. And Rock yeah, solid. Yeah, she was, um, she was uh, let me just say she was a hypocrite. <laughs> right. <laughs> yes. Uh, but anyway, she dubbed me in and I remember um, um, all the girls had had their uh, interviews um, for the following season and I hadn't had mine and I was like, what's doing here? Like yeah. I basically I smell a rat yeah, something ain't right. And I remember I'd asked if I could meet up with some people from the dogs in the marketing team who were kind of oversaw us um, to talk about things of how we could improve the season the following year. And and I <laughs> remember sitting at um uh, might have been in Joe Bell's actually in Belmore, and um and the this lady said, "Look, we've heard that you're dating a player," and I was sitting there like, "No." <laughs> No, <laughs> don't know what you're talking no, about. Like, you know, six. Yeah, it's like a good eight months into our relationship. No, <laughs> and to make it even funnier is that like he lived in. Um, they had like a like a, a house share house. They yes, a share house, and so he lived next door to Canterbury Leagues Club in yeah. this filthy, filthy share house. Um, a lot of players. Um gosh, some secrets and things went down in that house um, that I was privy to. But uh, he lived in this share house. And I remember in the, in the early days of when we started dating, I'd park down the other end of the street because um, I had like a bright green car and I would walk down. And um, anyway, it was it just made the whole thing so funny when I look back at it that he lived in this share house and I would sneak in and everything. But, yeah, I was sitting there in a the leagues club around the corner from the share house <laughs> um, being like, no, I think I was even probably going back to his place <laughs> <laughs> that's the that's a chopper read style mate deny 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 it's so funny anyways um they caught wind they figured it out this girl must have had evidence and i you know chased them up was like where's my interview what's going on and on the day of the interview um i get a phone call from my dad so my dad my parents were actually sponsors player sponsors at yeah. the time and um and he had formed a really good relationship with a lot of the guys that were in the sponsorship team and one of them actually gave him a heads up rang my dad and said we've heard that they they're basically going to sack Darcy um but they're going to offer us something else do you want to just let her know so I knew beforehand and I remember I dressed up to the nines and you know walked in in my high heels thinking like sack me now <laughs> and then I walked in and, and I remember they were they were, lo- they were lovely about it they were like look we know you're dating a player and we know who it is. Like, just admit it. <laughs> I was like, fine. <laughs> um, so, you know, we. I remember sitting there being like, but it's serious. You know, our parents have met each other. Like, <laughs> 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 where's um, Dust? Where's Brad playing? He's playing Ron Massey now. Where's he playing at? Yeah, so he's playing for Hill Bulls. Yeah. Um, so he played. He won Ron Massey Cup Player of the Year actually last year. So that was a bit of fun. We got to go to the Brad Fittler Awards together. Good. I didn't have to work. I got to go as a plus one. <laughs> Were you allowed, or was there was there a contract clause that no you contract. weren't allowed? You didn't have to sneak in. Allowed. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know no... the funniest thing about this whole situation is that he ended up doing basically why they sacked me is because he ended up doing a preseason, a full time preseason with the NRL squad. And I think the people in head office assumed that he was, you know, top 30 NRL, which he wasn't. It was a, a basically a training trial. Um, and so they said to me, like, you've either got to pick your cheerleading or him. And I was like, well, I'm not going to cheerlead forever. No. Um, so I picked him. And obviously it was the right decision because we we're engaged to get married. Yeah. But he ended up leaving the club six months later. He got a relief. <laughs> So did you ring them and say, can I come back now? Listen, yeah, he's not part of, he's not one of your club <laughs> now. Can I come back? No, I was like, it's too far gone. But I remember saying to him, I was like, you couldn't have made this decision six months earlier. <laughs> <laughs> so Darcy, obviously um, involvement with the media, you've, you're involved with a, a few different areas. You're on the sideline um, in front of the camera and also uh, in mm-hmm. the print print media as well. Uh, tell yeah, us, so tell us, tell us website. about, tell us about what uh, all the all the pr- roles that you've currently got. 
So I write for the website. Um, I host the Fox League podcast and then I do sideline as well. So I wear three different hats and and I was, you know, talking earlier about when you're building your profile in this industry, you kind of got to take on a lot. And I'm in that stage at the moment where I haven't quite made it yet. Um, and I have to prove myself in multiple areas and I've got to take on a lot. Um, so yeah, I, I write for the website. I think I do usually, um, three shifts a week, which is actually a blessing because I used to actually do full five shifts a week and then my sideline on top of it, it would work out that I was basically working seven days a week from March to October. Um, but I've got a little bit more flexibility where I only have to work five to six days a week now. Um, so I, yeah, I, uh, I write in digital. So I do, um, I, I write like my own kind of gen, um, original stories and, and then I, yeah, host a podcast every Monday. Um, you're very good. You're very good at people. that too on the podcast. I might oh, add. Thank you. Very good. I'm learning on the run. It's my first season doing it and I source all the, um, the players and everything on my own. I don't have a budget. So I basically beg the players, please come on. I, I can't offer you anything, but please come on. <laughs> Um, and then, yeah, I've got sideline, which I do usually New South Wales Cup and NRL, so two games a week. Um, it keeps me very busy. <laughs> do you find, just on that with the players coming on, do you find they're a lot more accommodating now as they're probably similar to you trying to build their own brand and and get their own personality out there, which could lead to sponsorship and, and bigger and better things as well? So they're, they're more accommodating in that sense? Yeah, a little bit. It depends. I I guess it depends on who you ask. So someone like I had Tyrell Sloan on um, at the start of the year and my goodness, like what a sweetheart because I had actually asked another dra- – I won't throw him under the bus, but I'd actually asked another Dragons player um, in the sheds because I'd actually done sideline for their game and um, and I waited around until they all came out because I knew I wanted to get him on and I went over and I asked him and he said yes great, no worries. Um, you know, I went to bed, I could sleep at night because I thought I've got a guest locked in. And then um, the the following day on the Monday, I messaged him to make sure he was still all good. And then he said, oh, sorry, I can't do it anymore. Mm. Oh, my God. Uh, and and then some of these players, it's like, you don't, you don't understand the pressure that's on me to have a guest on. And, you know, all you're doing is you're basically pushing me to almost breaking point because I'm in tears trying to find someone. And then um, – you know, the Dragons media manager, absolute legend. He used to be a journalist, so he gets it. Yeah. And he um, arranged for someone else, another Dragons player, who had said yes to him. And then I just reached out to that dra- second Dragons player to touch base and and he then also said, no, I can't do it. And I was like, what? What's going <laughs> on here? the media manager, you can. So then I rang the media manager. I was like, who can I get? Like, you know, Tyrell Sloan, Jaden Sullivan, they're both interesting young guys. And God bless his soul, Tyrell Sloan, dead set, came in clutch with 15 minutes notice, um, jumped on the podcast, and he was one of the most incredible interviews I've done. He was so um, well-spoken, just a lovely, lovely young man. So players like that, those guys that are trying to build their profiles, yeah. um, Absolutely. And then I've had players like Christian Welch, like a, he's oh, the captain yeah. of the Storm. So he knows yeah. that these things, mm. you know, he, you got to do these things. So he was great as well. Um, so it's a bit hit and mess, uh, miss. I've had a player, <laughs> I won't say his name, I had a player, big name player, um, tell me that he would only do it for money. Um, Paul Gallon. Interest rates are, <laughs> no. <laughs> he would only do it for money because interest rates are killing him at the moment. Oh, that'll do um, me. He's on at least 700000 <laughs> Wow, wow. There you um, go. And I was like, cool. <laughs> Here I am in my like one and a half bedroom in Western Sydney. Um, cool. <laughs> yeah, work, working uh, working seven days a week trying to uh, to make ends meet. And uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, a bit, bit of both, but for most part, the play like I've had Damien Cook on, who's yeah, played Origin for Australia, everything, and he was absolutely outstanding. He was one of the easiest players to lock in. Yeah, um, yeah, and, and a total professional. He comes so across goes, like you know, that too, does. Oh, he's awesome. He's yeah. so awesome to deal with. One of the best. Now, this is probably a two-part question. Do you? And it's probably easy is not the right term, but with. With some trendsetters like Erin Molan and Yvonne Sampson in the role of uh, a female journalist, and I don't want to sound sexist, but do you find it a little bit easier 
that they've maybe set the platform for someone like yourself to come through? Absolutely. Like they've done all the hard yards. Um, my, I'm quite lucky as well. My, so Brad's, my partner's auntie is Michelle Bishop at yes. Channel 7. Um, and she's been around for a long time and in, and she's one of the hardest workers in the industry. So I'm so lucky that I've, I've got her as well that she knows a lot of people, has great contacts. Um, and, yeah, people like her, Vonnie, Erin Molan, um, they've definitely kind of broken through that barrier, I guess you could call it, um, and proven to any people that doubted women's presence in um, the industry that they that we absolutely absolutely do have a place in this industry. So, um, one thousand percent, they've I would say they've made it easier. Like I've I've. 95% of my experiences in this industry have been positive and I absolutely put it down to them. That's fantastic. And then the second part of that question is, who do you look up to? Oh, that's a good question. Oh, well, I definitely would look up to my auntie-in-law, Michelle, because I think she's had to, she's had to, I've watched her grind um, and she does a lot of, she does a lot of breaking news and things like that. And that's something that we see mainly men do. Um, and she's very strong, rock solid, very strong in this industry. But also I love Vonnie. Like I, I, I Vonnie and Lara at, at Fox and, um, a so cycle, like they've been around for a while and they're so respected yeah. and I think they're so good at what they do and they both bring different things to the table. Um, and I love how much they back themselves as well. Like they don't have any doubts. They just, they know, know their worth and they know what they bring to the industry. Um, and yeah, I like. I think they're all really awesome. Lara's a Mad Dragon supporter. <laughs> she is. Yes. And Vonnie and Vonnie's husband's a Mad Dragon supporter too. He, yeah, he is. That's true. <laughs> now, away from work, when you do get some spare time, how do you relax? Um. Well, I yeah don't really get much time at the moment because when I'm at this year, when I'm not working, I'm planning a wedding, um, which is just. Crazy, That's a full time full time gig it's, on its own. Oh, tell me about it. I like to call it a surprise party for my fiance because <laughs> he's got no idea. <laughs> surely, surely us blokes put all the hard work in. I, Brad would have said, uh, "Tell me the time, tell me the venue, and I'll be there." Is that what he said? Tell me what to wear. Yeah, he's got he's got one job, and it's to arrange a car. And he has um, he's going to get us a car that Tim Zoo gets to his fights. Lovely. <laughs> Yeah, not exactly a wedding car, but anyways. It's a bit fun. Um, <laughs> not, not where you're. That's not. That's not horse drawn carriage or anything say, like Darcy that. Darcy was looking. Darcy was looking for a horse drawn carriage. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking something. You know, I don't know, some cool car with the ribbons, a convertible. But he's got. I think he's getting us a van with like it's like a limousine on the like a stretch Hummer on Hummer. the inside with drinks and everything like that. Anyways, <laughs> where's the reception at, Darcy? Um, it's, so we're getting married on a boat. The whole thing, Lovely. ceremony and reception, is on Starship. It's a big boat on the harbour. How good is that? Really What's the chance of someone yeah. falling in there? <laughs> well, yeah, yeah probably. It, it, we didn't want a traditional wedding. We wanted like a party. So. Yeah, that's good. Is that to keep the the new idea on the or Woman's Day away from all the paparazzi, paparazzi that type of thing? Can't oh. get out in the water. I don't think anyone. <laughs> I don't think anyone would care about my idea. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, we thought it'd be fun. Um, but we're uh, we're since learning that it's a bit of a bit of a logistical nightmare um, planning a wedding on a boat because not only does um, weather matter like rain, wind matters as well. Yeah. In terms of how everything pans out, but that's okay. That's okay. You'll have no. There'll be Positive no. The vibes. weather will be great. It'll be perfect. But yeah. when I'm not planning a wedding, I'm usually watching Real Housewives. I'm obsessed <laughs> with it. <laughs> wow. Real there you go. <laughs> I know. You oh. could actually push for Fox to have like and Real Housewives of the Sutherland Shire because there'd be a show oh down there. Oh. There would be a show down there. Absolutely. I agree. Some of well, Remember Nolene, Nolene from Sylvania Waters. She was the original. Well, even, uh, even the Shire, the show that they the had Shire, a few. The Shire. The Shire. The Shire. The the Real Housewives of the Sutherland Shire. The Real Housewives. Yeah, put that to crawls on uh, Fox, mate. Yeah, put that. There's a yeah. new show, right? Branch away from it. I'd I'd watch it 100. <laughs> percent They'd all be in active wear. <laughs> yeah. Down the we'll mall. Yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly right. Exactly right. <laughs> now to end the podcast, we get to know you a little bit better with our fast five questions, and they're just rapid fire. Yeah. What would be your yeah. last meal? 
Oh, probably a chicken parmigiana, extra chips, and a side of gravy. Oh, that's been ordered a few times. That's how good. <laughs> Can't beat that. And and to go with it, your drink of choice. Um, well, I'm not a big alcohol drinker, so I, I love just a, like a nice glass of Coke. But if I had an, uh, an alcoholic beverage, probably like a vodka solo. Vodka solo, okay, yeah, very nice. Yeah, I don't drink wine, I don't drink champagne, I drink lolly drinks. So cocktails, vodka lemonade, vodka solos, vodka raspberries. Vodka raspberries, I haven't mate. Acquired, can't, yeah, can't I'm beat the vodka raspberries. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, love a good cruiser. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, what is one of your weird quirks? Oh, I don't know. I was thinking about this earlier, and I think I don't know if it's a quirk, but I cannot go to bed at night without having a full bottle of water, like I can't be half empty. My drink bottle has to be full and I have to have lip balm next to my bed too. I don't know why. I just can't stand the thought of waking up in the middle of the night and not having lip balm or a full bottle of water. Don't know why. I, I have the lip balm, but I don't have the water. That's because yeah, you got well, a, I need the, I could, yeah, the lip I need balm. The lip balm is a must. That's because you've got a weak bladder though. Yes. <laughs> exactly. No, I'm okay. <laughs> uh, who is the most famous contact you have in your phone? Oh, I don't really have that many famous people. I guess it would just be footy people. So like a Benji Marshall, Cooper Cronk, people like that. Other than that, I don't really have anyone famous. That's pretty good, mate. That's up there for for us. That's up there. That's up there for famous. (laughs) That's good. And finally, if heaven does exist, what would God say when you arrive at the KRGS Pearly Roller Shutter? Uh, I don't know. I think you'd I think you'd welcome me into the VIP line because I'm a bit of an angel. Like I don't I, I don't get up to much mischief. So I reckon I'd be straight through VIP business class in. You'd probably be on the bus that takes you straight down into the car park now so the VIP. Yeah, exactly. Exactly, exactly. I'd be in there with all the um royalty, like you know, sporting royalty, music royalty. I'd be kicking kicking my feet up somewhere there. Well, after today's podcast and it's been revealed that you were dating a player when you shouldn't have been, the questions might be asked up there. So this will get straight, sent straight to Buzz Rothfield. He'll yeah, be, he'll you'll be, be on the, be, what's we'll, the buzz? Yeah, you'll be on the buzz. <laughs> what's the buzz this week? We'll, we'll let him know. Darcy McDonald, you, um, you're, you're an absolute star. Thanks for coming on and being a part of the KRGS Doors podcast. Um, keep up the great work in all your media that you're doing. We will no doubt see you on the sideline and, and hear your dulcet tones on the sideline or, or on your podcast that you're doing. Uh, but it's it's great to get um, a, a female from the rugby league on to have a chat. And it's uh, keep up the good work. Uh, love the story. And um, when you've got your own show at Fox uh, with Steve Crawley, don't forget us. We're happy to come on and, and uh, have an opinion on, on anything as well. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for having me. It's been an absolute pleasure. It has been. It's been a lot of fun. You um, you mentioned Tyrell Sloan before that he was an incredible interview. Uh, this one's been it's up there, incredible. It's, yeah, it's, it's been, been really good. We appreciate Aww, your time. Thank you. <laughs> so open and honest. Fantastic. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> Again, thank you for joining us. You should be extremely proud of what you have achieved so far, and uh, we wish you all success in the future. Oh, thank you, guys. Thank you so much. Thanks, Stars. We'll see you on the sideline. Thank you. Bye, guys. Appreciate it. <laughs> that brings the door down on the 49th episode in our chat with Darcy McDonald, journalist and reporter for Fox Sports. If you want to follow what Darcy is up to, you can catch her on her Fox League podcast or follow her on Instagram. Just search Darcy McDonald. If you have missed any previous episodes of the KRGS Doors podcast, you can download them from our website, www.krgsdoors.com.au forward slash podcast, or on your favourite podcast player, search KRGS Doors. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button to ensure you don't miss any future episodes. This also boosts our ranking and my ego. The other thing I suggest, if you've enjoyed the podcast, visit your favourite podcast player and leave a review or a rating. Keep your ears peeled for our upcoming next episode where we speak to professional female boxer Ella Boot, currently 5-0 in her professional boxing career and ANBF Australian champion. Keep your ears peeled for that one. It's one not to be missed. I've been your host, Drew Blackman, and you've been fantastic for tuning in today. As always, you could be anywhere in the world, but you're here with us. Thanks. Till next time. 
The KRGS Doors Show, proudly brought to you by KRGS Doors. For all your shopfront roller shutters, roller grills, folding closures and bifold doors, visit www.krgsdoors.com.au.